guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Today, we'll talk about management of intermittent claudications when my calf hurts, when my thighs hurt. We will focus our discussion on the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, such as silostazole. With that said, now let's get started. Let's go back to square one. Your body is made of systems, systems made of organs, and organs are made of tissues, tissues are made of... Look at you. One of those systems is the cardiovascular system. The cardiovascular system is made of cardio and vascular. Amazing. Let's talk about vascular vessels. You have arteries, you have veins, and you have capillaries. If I have diseases in my vessels, we'll call them peripheral vascular diseases usually when the vessel is narrow, okay? However, intermittent claudications are specifically a problem in the artery. So a more proper name is peripheral arterial disease or PAD. So in the past, we used to call them peripheral vascular diseases, but now since doctors are super sophisticated to the point of being stupid, we call them peripheral arterial diseases. My artery can get narrow and this narrowing could be sudden, or gradual, aka the difference between acute and chronic. As Charles Dickens once said, everything was acute, everything was chronic. The acute sudden occlusion is known as acute limb ischemia, but the chronic gradual narrowing is known as intermittent claudications. Which one do you think is more dangerous? Of course, the acute limb ischemia. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Intermittent claudications. Where the flip did the name come from? Intermittent means episodic, not continuous. What about claudications? It came from a Latin word known as claudicare, to limp, because of the severe calf pain followed by thigh pain. Intermittent claudications, risk factors, arteriosclerosis, such as atherosclerosis, arthritis, example, Takayasu arthritis, connective tissue diseases, Werger's disease has a very strong correlation with smoking and for this patient the first thing to do is to ask the patient to stop smoking it works like magic but of course it's easier said than done symptoms of intermittent claudications include pain okay be specific where's the site of the pain in the calf and then followed by pain in the thigh what's the character of that pain it's achy it's crampy it is tiring. You get sick and tired of being sick and tired. What precipitates the pain? Exercise. Exertion. Okay, what relieves the pain? You stop walking or stand up. The pain of intermittent claudications is different from the pain of spinal stenosis, such as disc herniation or sciatica. It's also different from the pain of arthritis and different from the pain of venous insufficiency. So if you want to be a good clinician rather than a doofus with a stethoscope, bring out a piece of paper and try to compare among these four diseases. 1. Intermittent claudications. 2. Spinal stenosis, aka disc herniation. 3. Arthritis. 4. Venous insufficiency. Your points of comparison should be the site of the pain, the character of the pain precipitated by and relieved by. How can we diagnose intermittent claudications or vascular claudications or peripheral arterial disease in the lower extremities? Okay, physical exam, decrease peripheral pulses. Or like peripheral as opposed to what? As opposed to central. What do you mean? I mean like putting the stethoscope on the apex of the heart. It will be okay. However, the pulses in the lower extremities are weak, meaning that the problem is not in the heart. Necessarily, it's in the arteries. Cardiovascular, baby, it's either cardio or vascular or both. Next, you can do the ankle brachial index. If the ankle brachial index is less than 0.9, this could be diagnostic for intermittent claudication. If it is less than 0.5, this indicates severe stenosis of the artery. Continuous wave Doppler ultrasound exercise tolerant test. So, this pain, as you know, is precipitated by exercise. So, you can ask the patient to walk, run, etc. If this causes the pain, this can be helpful to arrive at the diagnosis. And when the belief hits the fan and you're still a doofus and you cannot figure it out, go with the magnetic resonance and geography. How can we manage intermittent claudications? First of all, if the patient is a smoker, please stop smoking. Use antihyperlipidemics, antihypertensives, antiplatelet therapy, 
anti-phosphodiesterase, aka phosphodiesterase inhibitors, such as the famous silastazole, adequate foot care and exercise. But hey, wait, 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 medicosis. You just said that exercise can precipitate the pain. And you want me to ask the patient to exercise? Yes, indeed. Moderate exercise three to four times per week is good for 99.9% .9 of people. So you exercise between 30 to 45 minutes at least three days a week. That's very good for your cardiovascular health. After all of this, if the patient's life is still like a country song, you can do intervention. So angioplasty with stent. Vascular bypass, so you bypass the problem where the atherosclerosis is, or end arthrectomy, you cut it out. And these procedures are performed by vascular surgeons, aka butchers who make lots of money. Hey, medicosis, why didn't you become a vascular surgeon? A vascular surgeon? Dude, I'm terrified to change the light bulb. You want me to mess up with your vessel? Shut up. I live within my means. Let's focus on the phosphodiesterase inhibitors such as silastazole. Okay, first of all, what the flip is a phosphodiesterase, and then let's inhibit it. Okay, a phosphodiesterase is an enzyme. No kidding. What does it do? Here is the story morning glory. ATP is here. You know ATP? Yeah, it's the energy currency in your body. Where do you get it from? Oh, you get it from adenosine monophosphate. And then you add a phosphate, it becomes adenosine diphosphate. You add another phosphate, it becomes adenosine triphosphate. The energy currency of your cell. Given to you by your mitochondria, those powerhouse energy producing studs. Then this ATP by the adenylate cyclase will become cyclic AMP, cyclic adenosine monophosphate. By the phosphodiesterase, it's gonna be taken to the cleaners. Let's degrade it into pieces of trash. But of course, don't say to your professor, pieces of trash, be more sophisticated. Let's say degradation products, inactive metabolites, etc. Can you give me an example of a phosphodiesterase inhibitor medication? Sure, you have silastazole, you have dipyridamol. The one that's used for intermittent claudications is usually silastazole. How about dipyridamol? This is for cardiac stress test. When the patient cannot run on a treadmill, let's say I broke my leg. But I still have chest pain. I think I have a heart attack. Okay, uh, let's do an EKG. Normal. Uh, let's do a cardiac stress test. But I cannot run on a treadmill. Okay, let's inject something into your veins to make your heart stressed, to make your heart pump faster and stronger. And then we'll hook you up with an echo or whatever to see what's going on with your heart. Thank you. How does a phosphodiesterase inhibitor work? It inhibits the phosphodiesterase. You don't say. Therefore, what's going to happen when you inhibit this enzyme? Cyclic AMP is going to pile up. And then when cyclic AMP piles up, it causes what? It increases contraction of cardiac muscles, decreases contraction of smooth muscles, and decreases platelet aggregation. How is that helpful to a patient with intermittent claudications? Let me explain. What was the risk factors or causes of intermittent claudications? Oh, arteriosclerosis, like atherosclerosis. Oh, your vessel is narrow, right? Yeah, let's dilate it. Oh, that makes sense. A narrow vessel is very vulnerable to clots, correct? Yeah, let's decrease platelet aggregation. Genius. So silastazole will cause vasodilation and it will decrease platelet aggregation. How did it happen? Because you increase cyclic AMP. How come? Because I inhibited its inhibitor. I degraded its degrader. I destroyed its destroyer. Here is the story. Adenylate cyclase enzyme converts ATP into cyclic AMP, activating protein kinase A. Protein kinase A has two different functions. If you are a cardiac muscle, I will boost your contractility. But if you are a smooth muscle, I will decrease your contractility. So if you happen to be a bronchi, bronchodilation, I'm decreasing the contractility. How about a vessel? Vasodilation, I'm decreasing your contractility. Note that everything here is an A, adenylate cyclase, ATP, cyclic AMP, protein kinase A, vasodilation, bronchodilation. We have two main organs that love cyclic AMP. Your heart loves cyclic AMP. Why? Because it increases cardiac contractility. Okay, so you can run on a treadmill. How about your bronchi? They love cyclic AMP. Why? Because cyclic AMP dilates your bronchi so that you can breathe. 
There is a third organ that adores cyclic MP vessels because it dilates them. Have you ever wondered why epinephrine increases cardiac contractility? Why norepinephrine increases cardiac contractility? How does dopamine, dobutamine increase cardiac contractility? How does celastazole, melrinone, etc. relax your vessels and increase cardiac contractility? It's all thanks to the cyclic AMP. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Functions of cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP decreases triglycerides. That's awesome. Increases HDL, the good cholesterol, quote unquote, which is awesome. Decrease inflammation. Wonderful. Increase endothelial repair. Decrease platelet aggregation. Decrease smooth muscle proliferation. And then when it comes to contraction, if you are a cardiac muscle, I will increase your contraction. If you are a smooth muscle, I will decrease your contraction. If your professor explained it like this, I will retire from YouTube and work as a vascular surgeon. Cyclic AMP makes your heart happy, your bronchi happy, and your vessels happy and dilated so that you do not suffer the pain of intermittent claudications. Cyclic AMP not only dilates the vessels, not only dilates bronchi, it also increases cardiac conductivity, increases heart rate, and increases renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, etc. So if cyclic AMP dilates my vessels, what does cyclic GMP do? Also dilates vessels. Oh, how come? Well, cyclic GMP acts on protein kinase, not A, G. And this will activate phosphatase, remove the phosphate group from the active myosin light chain, and it will become inactive myosin light chain. Inactive myosin light chain means no contraction. No contraction equals relaxation of the smooth muscle, which means dilation of the vessel. There are many drugs that utilize this pathway and dilate your vessel. Hydralazine, nitroprusside, nitrates, they dilate vessels, arteries, veins, etc. Sildenafil, Tadenafil, Vardenafil, they dilate vessels in a certain organ that I will not mention because YouTube is for kids now. Here is one of the most important facts in medicine. Never, ever, ever, ever combine one of these with one of these. You will kill the patient. A patient who's taking Viagra should not be taking sublingual nitroglycerin. Why not? Both of them dilate vessels. So what? When you dilate vessels so much, what's going to happen to the radius of the vessel? Oh, the radius of the vessel will, of course, increase. And what's going to happen to re the resistance when the radius decreases like this? Oh, the resistance has to go down. Perfect. And when the total peripheral resistance goes down, what do you think will happen to the blood pressure? Oh, the blood pressure will also go down. If the blood pressure goes down too much, the patient can die from severe hypotension. If this did not kill the patient, the reflex tachycardia can also kill the patient. Hashtag baroreceptor reflex, hashtag my doctor was a doofus. Phosphodiesterase inhibitors, what do they inhibit? They inhibit the phosphodiesterase. Okay, what was the function of the phosphodiesterase? To take the cyclic AMP to the cleaners and to take the cyclic GMP to the cleaners. Therefore, when you give me a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, this enzyme is gone. I will not take anyone to the cleaners. Cyclic AMP will increase and cyclic GMP will also increase and they will dilate your vessels. This is for little kids. If you want to be a freaking pharmacist, you need to know that not all phosphodiesterase enzymes are created equal. We have subtypes of them. There is phosphodiesterase 3, phosphodiesterase 5, etc. We found out that phosphodiesterase 4, 7, and 8 are responsible for taking the cyclic AMP to the cleaners. But phosphodiesterase 5, 6, and 9 are responsible for degrading cyclic GMP. Phosphodiesterase 1, 2, 3, 10, and 11 can degrade both of them. Give me example of these medications. Theophylline, caffeine, aminophylline, methyl xanthine, xanthine, etc. These are non-selective phosphodiesterase inhibitors. They inhibit everything. Sildenafil is just for phosphodiesterase 5. Dipyridamol inhibits phosphodiesterase 3, silosazole 3, Melrinone also 3. This is one of the drugs that can help you if you have heart failure because it boosts cardiac contractility. Medicine makes perfect sense if 
explained properly. If you would like to learn more about antihyperlipidemics, I have a video on my channel called Lipid Lowering Agents. You will find it in my pharmacology playlist. If you want to learn about the platelets and the antiplatelets, anticoagulants, fibrinolytics, etc., check out my bleeding and coagulation playlist. If, however, you are eager to learn about antihyperlipidemics, antiarrhythmics, antiangel, antihypertensives, diuretics, digoxin, and all of these medications, check out my cardiac pharmacology course on my website medicosisperfectionalis.com. Comes with 50 videos and cases and notes and a mind map. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Go to Picmonic for animated medical mnemonics. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.